Hello everyone and welcome to Russell's online live classes. I have something very different for you today and that is focus on vocabulary. Very often uh, we have certain words which are commonly used along with certain topics. So let's go, go through them so that you can use them easily when you are trying to speak on these, some of these usual topics that come in any conversation, come in, in any conversation. All right. All right. Now let's talk of people who are working. Somebody says, how's your job? How do you, how, how is, um, I mean, what's your workplace like? How do you like your job? What's a job like? Right. Most of the offices are great today, but what is your job like? If you want to describe your job, for example, what are the words you would need to use to be able to talk about that particular job? All right. Like general common, you must have heard. A mine is a nine to five job. Yes, nine to five is a regular working hours. No, nothing very different. Nine to five job. What you do between that is again talking about the particular job. But when you're describing it's a nine to five job or it's a night shift job. It's a rotational shift job. So I sometimes go from morning to afternoon, sometimes afternoon to evening, sometimes evening to next morning. It is rotation. So one month I do this, one month I do that, and the other month I do. This has become more common nowadays because of the world becoming a smaller place. Right? We, we work along with the different countries in the world, and so sometimes we have to match their timings. And so that is the reason why these kind of jobs have become more and more popular, right? So we have different kinds of timings according to which we can talk about our job. As I said, a traditional nine to five or a night shift job or a rotational shift job. All right. Then there are many other ways you can describe mine is a very touring job. Let's say you are a salesperson. Mine is a touring job. Mine is a, you know, on the move kind of job. I keep visiting people. I go from place to place and I probably sell. So you can refer to it as a touring job. Hmm? All right. And you can talk of a sedentary job. What is a sedentary job? Where you sit to your desk, where you don't move around too much. Okay. Sometimes it is uh, not good for health, really. If you are constantly seated in one position and you're doing work, you know the tricks. Every one of us knows you need to get up once in a while, go for a walk, at least go for coffee, go for tea, go to the other desk, come back, change your position, stand up and sit down and things like that. You should not constantly sit in front of a, a, a computer or a desk or on your seat in, in front of the desk. Now, let I've taken some of these words. Let's go through, through this. Of course, today's uh, rosy jobs or today's everybody's aiming for an MNC. What is an MNC here? Expanded version is a multinational company. Most youngsters are aiming for jobs in a multinational company for a variety of reasons, for the kind of exposure, for the kind of payments, for the kind of perks. I think once earlier I had mentioned about perks, which I have not written here. What are perks? Generally perks, the additional advantages you get of working in a particular place. Perks, we'll come to that. So you have an LMNC job. That is what most people aim for. And especially in uh, now with the advent of computers and the, uh, uh, the changes that are happening uh, every time, the computers, uh, the languages, the, the types of computers. So everything around computers is always changing. There is a change every year. It's an ever growing kind of a field. So there are lots and lots of opportunities and lots of lots of innovations in this job. So there are plenty of opportunities, if you know what I mean. You need to do, you need to update your skills, you need to keep learning and you need, and there are more and more MNCs adapting. All right, so you are, you can have an MNC job. You can have a white collar job. This is the traditional way of explaining jobs where people who worked in offices in a good ambience, probably with an AC, probably with other perks. That is a white collar job. And blue collar job is when you get your hands dirty, when you do some work with your hands and make a living. 
So the difference between white collar and blue collar is one who sits and works in an office and one who works with his hands. So you call it a blue collar job and a white collar job. All right. Okay. Then you have a very, it's a very enriching job. You learn something new every day. You enrich yourself. You have learned something and you know a little, but every time you're learning something new on the job, then you say it's a very enriching job. I really love this job. I'm getting training in so many different aspects of this job. I'm enjoying it. It's very en enriching. Uh, it's very motivating. You get a lot of encouragement. You get a lot of maybe even additional income periodically. So it is very, very motivating. I am learning, I'm gaining, I'm getting a lot of uh, encouragement. So it is highly motivating. Okay. Uh, I, uh, Satisfying, not a satisfying. It's a satisfying job. It's all on the whole. It's a very satisfying job. I'm very happy. I look forward to getting to my workplace every day. If these things are available in a job, in your work ambience, then obviously this would apply to your kind of job. It's a very challenging job. It's a very stressful job. Constantly I am under pressure to meet deadlines, to get things done. There is a constant flux and I'm always on the move and I'm always thinking on my feet. So that is a challenging job with which sometimes can be very stressful. Of course, there are types and types of people, people who cannot work without challenges and people who, who really become a weak need when there's a, when there's a challenge in front of them. You need to go ahead and face the challenges, try to uh, get uh, an answer to every situation and then your adrenaline will run high. Then you won't feel the stress. So it depends on you whether you take stress too much or whether you accept challenges as part of your job. Okay, you need to take it as part of your job because today's job is full of challenges, right? So it's a challenging job. It's a stress stressful job. It's a, but all the same, it's a very lucrative job. It's meaning well paid. The money is substantial. For the work I do, I get a lot of money, which is very satisfying also. Correct? So a lucrative job is a very well paid job. Mine is a lucrative job, you can say, if it is a well paying job. Of course, you have different types of job, a government job, which has certain different kinds of, uh, uh, let's say, you may call it perks. A lot of security, a lot of additional advantages if you are in a government job, in a private firm. Yes, hire and fire is a policy of many private firms. You need to be on your toes. You need to produce results to survive in a private job. Correct? All right. Uh, you, you have, it's a tedious job. Some, some government jobs, I, I beg your pardon, I may be wrong. But many jobs are very tedious and boring. You do the same thing in and out. Every morning I open the same files. I have to fill in the same details or I have to open the, open the computer, feed the same details. It's kind of a monotonous job, a tiring, a boring job. There are some jobs like that, all right, where there are many new things to do. So you can call it a tedious job or a boring job. I already told you about a desk job and a sedentary job and a touring job, right? So these are the kinds of jobs according to the work pressures, according to the payment, according to who manages the, uh, the organization, whether it's run by the government, whether it is run by a, a private, a private uh, group of people. So e e different kinds of jobs are there. You can add, I'm sure from your experience, what, what kind of jobs you do. But these are some of the words, words you can use, adjectives, to describe any job. Generally, what kind? Is it a shift job? What are your timings of the job? What kind of a job is it? What kind of payment does it give? Is it government? Is it private? These are the main things that you need to talk about when you want to describe your job. Clear? All right. Now let's go on to something lighter. When you want to describe a film, a movie, okay? What are the elements that you look for in a movie, right? We'll go into that and see how you can analyze or what words you can describe. Now, of course, the most ones is, it's a dud. It's a flop. Dud means didn't take off. 
didn't make money, didn't interest the people, didn't uh, strike a chord at the box office. So it is a, a dud or a flop, which doesn't run much and the crowds dwindle even after the very first day. Whereas you can have a super hit, uh, movies that go on making money and cross the 100 crore, you join the 100 crore club, these movies. They make more than 100 crores. Sometimes they have had movies making 200, 300 crores in the recent past. So they are real money spinners. It's a real money spinner. What, when do you refer to a movie which has made a lot of money, much more than what, what was spent? Okay, so you say it is a super hit, blockbuster. You can also call it a blockbuster movie. Means it surpasses everyone's expectations. It's beyond the expectations of people. It's super hit, super duper hit. Then you call them like this. Then you have, what kind of movie was it? Oh, it's, a, uh, it's a nice comedy. Leave your brains behind and just watch it for the fun of it. Uh, a, a comedy. Then you have nowadays people flocking for action movies. Okay. There are people, there are people who love violence in movies. Yes, there are people who love uh, very beautiful uh, story, story based movies. So you can have different kinds of movies, a comedy movie, an action film movie, a love story, an animation movie. Animated movies are catching on today. Everybody is for animation in movies. Yes. And then you have uh, lots of biographies of people being made into movies. It's, it's a fad today. What's the meaning of a fad? Huh? It's a kind of a craze. Today's craze is biographies. You have so many movies made on great men. Who, have, who are, most of whom are no more, we usually base them. But lately we've had even some biographies coming out of people who are still alive. Okay, those are biographical movies based on the life of a person, dead or alive, and with facts and figures from the person's life. All right, generally, it is called a biographical film. And when, where are the films shot usually? Today we have movies shot in different countries in different places. So there are breathtaking locales. That is the place where you shoot the scenery, the beauty around the place, the natural beauty in those surroundings. They are breathtaking. That is awesome. Fantastic. Beautiful locales. Huh? So we have movies which are very pleasing to the eye today because we get to see different, uh, different countries, different uh, places, different beautiful uh, scenarios. All that add to the beauty of the film and it adds to the interest among the audience also. You would love to go and see beautiful places. Probably you can't afford to go to those countries. But you can see them in the movies and enjoy them while you watch the films. So you have breathtaking locales today and you have uh, fantastic music. In the past it was melodious movies. Today you have uh, rap music, you have foot tapping music, you have all kinds of music which have caught the fancy of people. So you have real good music. You go for a movie, for its story, for the kind of film it is, for the music, and for the choreography, fantastic choreography. What is choreography? To do with the dance steps. Okay, who manages the dances? Who is in charge of uh, training the actors and actresses in, their dan in the dances? So fantastic choreography. You have beautiful sets, awesome sets, and fantastic dances today, which attract, again, the audiences. So you talk of the choreography or the dance, the dances that are choreographed in the film, how good they are. Then you have, uh, very often you have a full length film, two hours, two and a half hours, two, a maximum of three hours. Then you have some which are documentaries, which are shorter versions. Not very popularly released in India, but you can see them on uh, certain other channels. Documentary films, full length films. And what is now the latest is web series. Okay, movies be, uh, made for, the, uh, for online viewing. Web series. It has caught the attention, it's gaining a lot of attention and is going to be a real success in the near future. Right? So many film directors, well-known directors, well-known actors and actresses are moving towards these web series. Earlier, you had 
TV actors and actresses coming into the movies. Now you have people from the movies, regular movies, going into the to acting in the web series. That's the latest. And you have films which are art films, which are commercial films. Uh, commercial is the understanding of the word is the movie that is made to make a lot of profits, mainly with the purpose of making profits. An art film usually is not only interested in the money, but also to depict something about a true story, a true facts, uh, something which is relevant to the fabric of the society. So usually you have a differentiators. Art films, not all people appreciate or go for art films, whereas commercial films are very populistic. They have songs, they have dances, they have uh, uh, good locales, as I told you, and so they are very popular. So commercial films made with the, uh, with the intention of um, getting more and more people to watch it are definitely more successful. But who love good, good films? Who are real critics of movies? They love art films. You must watch them and some of them are really, they leave a mark. They make you think. They make you sit up. Whereas a commercial film, you may see it one day and the next day you've probably forgotten what it was really all about. Correct? So there are differences. It had a, a, a how does the movie interest you? Oh, the plot was racy. Not for a minute did it, uh, you know, uh, wane off. Every time it held the interest of the audience. What's going to happen next? What's going to happen next? So it was a very racy plot. It had a very good storyline. All right. Uh, it had a lot of uh, drama. It had a lot of uh, uh, soul-stirring soul ideas. It had a very good message. So there are many reasons why, for which you can enjoy or uh, like a movie and make it a blockbuster, right? It is people who make films a blockbuster. If it, uh, if it is to your taste, if you like what you see, if you enjoy it for those two, three hours and you go to see it probably the second time, third time, then you make it a blockbuster, right? So films are, are of different categories. They suit the audiences of different types. And, but by and large, we can call uh, movies, you can refer to movies with using many of these words which I have put across here. They will help you to describe the movie. Oh, that movie was a real blockbuster. Hmm? The, uh, I, I didn't talk of the acting. The acting was fantastic. The actor was really good. He lived the room. Yes, and today uh, there is so much to do with the, uh, with the kind of makeup that people use. The actors and actresses, they transform themselves. Prosthetics, they use and to change their whole figure, their whole face, you unrecognizable. There are methods to make the actors and actresses almost unrecognizable. So there are lots of lots of changes in the movies from traditional ones. And these words will help you to describe any film, any movie that you've seen lately. All right, now let's go to some other place which we often go to when we are sick or go to see somebody when they are sick, right? So a hospital is a place where all of us at some time or the other go to visit. Now, what are the things that you can use? What are the words you can, oh, you went to the hospital. What kind of hospital is it? Oh, it's a multi-speciality hospital. There are all, uh, I mean, any um, problem, any health issue, whether it's to do with the heart, whether it's to do with the kidneys, whether it's to do with your, um, uh, let's say your, uh, lungs everything is taken so it is a multi-speciality hospital when you call a hospital multi-speciality it means it can take care of ailments of all kinds so it you can go to that hospital whatever your problem in health may be whatever your health issue is you can go to these multi-speciality hospitals okay it's a thousand bed uh, hospital it's a hundred bed hospital you can talk of the size of the hospital by the number of beds it has. Of course, beds can include many things. It can have special rooms, it can have wards, it can have uh, and different kinds of rooms. So you can talk of a so many bedded hospital, which shows you the size of the hospital, which tells you about the size of the hospital. Uh, uh, when, uh, when do you say that hospital is very good? When, when it has good critical care units. Because usually we rush to a hospital very often 
or when there is an emergency situation. So what is very important when a patient is taken with critical, uh, in a critical condition, you need good critical care units like the ICU and ICCU. Those have to be well maintained in a hospital. Yes, it is an essential part of a good hospital. So when you, you can, when you recommend a hospital, you can say these things. It's a multi-speciality hospital. It has good critical care units. So please put him there if somebody asks you for a suggestion. Or you can just describe a hospital using it. It's a private hospital. Okay. It's a corporate hospital. It's a government hospital. Okay. Depending on who mans the hospital, who runs the hospital, under whose care the hospital is run, under whose guidance. So you can call it, depending on that, the kind of hospital it is. And how should an ambience in a hospital be? Obviously, very, very clean and very, very spruce. So usually... When you walk into a hospital, you should get that feeling of a very a sterile feel, ambience. That is, everything is spick and span, very neat and clean. That gives a very good impression. And that is how it should be. Because it is meant to be a place where you're going for recovery for your health issues. Yes, it should not be a dirty or a squalid place. It will only add to your infections. So it should be very sterile. Okay, and generally uh, very neat and tidy. And they should have, it is very strict. It is better that a hospital is strict. There are strict visiting hours so that public does not move around too freely in the place. Because when we go from outside to a hospital, we tend to contaminate the place. Yes, so it is always better that you have visiting hours and few people visiting the patient. Most good hospitals have exact visiting hours. They don't allow people any time of the day. Right? So that is good. And then the, uh, when you talk of a hospital today, uh, it is not only the heartbeat doctors who are associated with that particular hospital. We have specialists coming into the hospital at different times of the day. Okay? They may be working in another hospital, but they are specialists in their fields. So they come as visiting doctors to the other hospital. So it, it is very common to have visiting doctors. A hospital may be good of its own, on its own. It has its own set of doctors. But you also have, many hospitals have specialists coming in to visit the hospital. So it has a pool of visiting doctors. Generally visiting doctors, doctors are experts in their own field. So you have them coming in. It has very good operation theatres. It has excellent uh, nursing care it has uh, it is well known for its aftercare now remember a doctor uh, i mean after a surgery after some treatment patients require a lot of care extra care after when they are recovering in the convalescing period so if, if a dog hospital has good nursing care you the person will be taken care of well taken care so it's very important that there is good nursing care in the hospital. How is the nursing care there? Yes, that is very. And of course, in all this comes, uh, there is, the hospital has a pharmacy. Many hospitals have a pharmacy attached to their building so that you don't have to go out or run out for medicines. All right, pharmacy is the place you know where medicines are sold. So you can go straight and you need not waste time. You go to the pharmacy attached to the hospital. In some, very many, most of them have their own diagnostic units. That is, what is a diagnostic unit? Where you go and uh, take tests. If supposing the doctor suggests some tests for you, you have to go and get it done, usually in a diagnostic center. So very many hospitals have their own diagnostic centers. So if you have to take a cardiogram, if you have to have an x-ray of some part of your body, you want to get a mammogram, you want to get any kind of test done, you go to the diagnostic unit of the hospital. So this hospital has all this. So obviously it is a very well-known hospital, well-reputed well hospital. Correct? So do doctors are important. The ambience is important. The kind of care is important. You need critical care, you need nursing care, you need uh, good operation, uh, good theatres. Yes, so all this is available. You can 
say this hospital is very good or you can pass your verdict on the hospital, right? So when you are describing a hospital, you can use these words, all right? Now, uh, when you want to describe people, I've come to something very much like a very different. Uh, when you describe people, there are very many words we use. Sometimes you may hear it, but you may not know what it means. Like, for example, you're talking, he's a trendsetter. What do you mean by a trend setter? What's a trend? A new kind of, uh, let's say, dressing or uh, behaving or whatever. He's a trend setter. Anything comes new in the market, he's the first to own it, possess it. He, his actions also, he sets trends. So he is a trend setter, not only in clothes, in behavior also. So he is a trend setter. You call a person who uh, usually does all novel things, different things, and sets a trend as it were. You call him a trend setter. You call somebody a dark horse. He's a dark horse. What do you mean by that? He has a lot of hidden potential. He doesn't show that he knows it all. People are not unaware, uh, not aware of it. But he proves himself in certain un, un, um, unforeseen circumstances. So he's a, you call him a duck horse. He's an eager beaver. This is a reference to a person who's very enthusiastic, who's always looking for new things to do, who's eager, eager all the time alert, wanting to know more, wanting to do more. He's an eager beaver. So when I describe a person as that, maybe he's joined my team lately. He's an eager beaver means he is willing to learn, very enthusiastic and wanting to know more and more and active. Willing to learn, eager to learn and active. You call such a person an eager beaver. When you refer to somebody, yeah, he's a real walking encyclopedia. He knows it all, everything, anything you ask him about, he has ready answers. He can give you answers about any topic that you want to clarify your doubts on. So you refer to somebody who, who is a know-all. He is a real know-all. It's something similar to he is a walking encyclopedia. He is a busybody. That is somebody who wants to interfere, who know all about what you do. In an office, you always have people like that who want to know what the other person is doing, what the other department is doing, what he is doing, what she is doing. He is a real busybody. Something like inquisitive person, nosy person, wants to know everything that's happening around. You call them a Who is a fair weather friend? Not a friend that you would want to have, I'm sure, if you know, when you know the meaning. Fair weather is, when the weather is good, how do you feel? Happy, lovely. You want to enjoy it. The weather is fine. So this kind of friend is willing to be with you when the weather is fine. That means when things are going well, when everything is perfect, he is willing to be your friend. But when you have problems, when you see dark days, when you are not in your element, he deserts you. He is nowhere to be seen. So you call such a person a fair weather friend. He is not a good friend. He is not a person who is going to stand by you. He is only going to show his face in good times. So he is referred to as a fair weather friend. Then I talk of my, I have a good friend who's a tough cookie. Nothing upsets him. Nothing makes him lose his confidence. He can face any rough situations, tough situations. He is a tough cookie. You refer to a person as a tough cookie. Now these are sometimes colloquial words and used often. So it's important to know what they mean. Correct? So you call him tough cookie. When you call a person, he's a jack of all trades. That is, he knows how to do. He, you ask him some problem in a computer, he's able to do it. You ask him about some electrical issues, he's able to do it. He's able to do it. He knows a lot about everything. But the other part is jack of all trades, but master of none. He's not a specialist. Oh, today's world of speciality, you have specialists. But this guy is a jack of all trades, means he knows about many things. Not necessarily master of one. When you refer to a person as a people's person, is one who you need to be. You need to get on with people. We work not in an island, we work with people. Yes? So we need to be able to get on, we need to know how to build, establish a rapport with others. Yes? How to be pleasant, 
how to make the peace person feel at home. Uh, when a person can do it, when he is popular, not in by, I don't mean in the, in the wrong sense, I mean, who is liked by all, who people rush to when they have an issue, when they have something to sort out, they go to that person, they want to discuss it. So that kind of a person is a people's person. Each of us should aim to be a people's person. Yes, then we can be a success in any place, whether it's at home or in the office or anywhere you go. You will be, you need, you will be a popular person. Who is a no-gooder? A no-gooder means he hasn't achieved anything in life. He's the black sheep of the family. Uh, everybody has succeeded, everybody is doing well, but he has not made it. He didn't complete, he's a dropout, he didn't complete his studies, and he has not done anything in his life, or he's not taken up any job. He is just wandering around. Hmm? He is a black sheep of the family, who has not done well, who has not made it in any field, and just whiles away his time. You say he's a no-gooder. He's a brick. What do you mean by brick? Something solid, something you can depend upon. So when I say he's a real, my brother's a real brick, that means he will stand by me in all situations. I can go to him for anything. I can trust him with anything. He is very dependable. Then such a person you call a brick. Got it? So you would love to have a lot of a brick in your life. I'm sure. A friend also. And he's a real brick. Whatever ups and downs I face, he's there with me. He stands by me. He is not a fair weather friend. Got it? Got the difference? All right. Similarly, you talk about somebody being a couch potato. What's the meaning of a couch potato? You sit in the couch. Usually, we refer to people who sit in front of the TV all day long or night long or evening long as a couch potato. That is, who has no other interest but sits on the couch in front of a It's called a couch potato. A person who is very idle. Okay? Who loves to waste time. Who's lazy, basically lazy, couch potato. And who's a, today the reference, the couch has changed to mouse also. That is somebody who's always in front of the computer, playing with the computer, uh, working on the computer, doesn't shift his eyes away from the computer. We call such a person a mouse potato today. This is the later reference to a person who's constantly at his computer. Is this? These are few of the ways. I thought of some. Words commonly used when we call, refer to people. Yes? Now, coming to a mall, I think along the way when we have described people, places, things, we have done this. How do you describe a mall? It's a, a multi-story building. It has escalators. It has capsule lifts. What are capsule lifts? The one where you can see the people moving up and down in a glass kind of a structure. Capsule lifts. You have escalators, you have shops, branded shops, shops selling all kinds of branded clothes. Yes, you have many foreign entr entrants in the market, so you have a lot of branded clothes that are available, usually in malls. Yes, under one roof, you can get many brands. That is the charm of visiting a mall. Otherwise, you go to Arrow, you buy, get only Arrow. Arrow shirts. You go to the garden variety, you get only garden sarees. So, but here you get a variety of different brands. So, brands are all there. And usually, malls have very good service. Yes, they have excellent salesmen. They have lots of people to take care of your needs. So, there is excellent service. And many of them are also provided with food box, where you can go and have a meal or have a have a peck of something, have a soft drink. Spend time, sit, relax, eat something. So food courts are common in most malls. As well as multiplexes. You have places where you can go and watch a movie too. Yes, most of the malls have a multiplex on the last floor, on the topmost floor. Where you can go and also watch a movie. Then you have displays. Uh, the clothes are displayed on mannequins. What are mannequins? Um, usually you have a... These are the figures 
on which the clothes are put. You have the figure of a lady, you have the figure of a guy, and the clothes are put on those mannequins. So you can have a look at how it would look on you. You can see it on the figure. So those are called those figures are called mannequins. So most malls have display like that. They have their clothes displayed on mannequins, and uh, many of the because you go around, it's very difficult to find parking. To place the malls are in busy places, so you have valet parking. Valet parking is when the the mall itself has some drivers, employed drivers, who will take your keys, car keys, and park your car inside. And when you come out, you go to the counter, talk about, give your number, car number, and the valet will go and. To bring back your car to the entrance. So that's a great service that most malls provide, which is called valet parking. It's not valet. You don't pronounce the word T. It's silent. It is valet parking. All right. Sometimes we go with our children. We don't know where to leave the children when we go shopping, and shopping may take hours. So you have play areas. Play areas are places where you can leave your children. To spend their time fruitfully, they can play in those areas and keep themselves occupied. So these are usually the facilities that are available in a mall, and that is why it it is so very popular today. Okay, so did you find it interesting? I have given you a lot, a lot of words built around different topics here. And I would like you to use them and make it a part of your speaking whenever you are, you have to speak on this, or when you are discussing. When somebody is discussing, you can join in. You can use the words that I have provided you with. Okay, that's all for today. Thank you, and see you again. Bye bye.